The following program is from aficionados who watch the film and discuss that film at the group's weekly Zoom meeting. The commentary voice are opinions of each individual blogger and have been edited for clarity. Today's film, Sergeant York, officially released on July 2nd, 1941, just five months before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The film was based upon America's most recognized hero of World War I, Alvin C. York. As Corporal York, he leads a seven-man attack on a German machine gun nest taking out 35 machine guns, killing 20 Germans, and eventually capturing 132 soldiers. York was uninjured. He was immediately promoted to sergeant and later received the Medal of Honor. Even more remarkable was Alvin York, a reluctant warrior. When drafted, he declared himself a conscientious objector. Only later did York change his belief. Killing men to protect other lives was a necessary evil of society. As early as 1919, York had been approached by the Hollywood producer Jesse L. Lasky to allow a movie be made of his life. York refused believing that this uniform ain't for sale and declined other endorsements as well. Lasky, for 20 years, persisted. York finally agreed to the film. The profits were to be used for a Bible school York wanted to build in his community. York, as a child, only had nine months formal education. He learned to read through his Bible studies. When Lasky first approached Alvin York, he wanted York to star in the film. It's only later, when York needed help funding the school, that Lasky realized York did not want to appear in the picture at all. I thought Alvin York is a very interesting character in that he waited so long, he didn't want to take advantage of uh, his... Uh, his notoriety in any ways. And it's an interesting contrast to uh, World War II and the most decorated hero in World War II, Audie Murphy. The guy is incredible. He's a, a small, young Texas uh, farm boy who goes on to win all the awards, including the Medal of Honor. Became a movie star and he actually went on to play in his own story to Helen Beck. And it's, it's a good movie if you haven't ever seen it. But he made, he made a lot of money off of his uh, acting afterwards. He lost a lot of it too, but he wouldn't do commercials for liquor or cigarettes because he said, no, that's not my image. And he refused to do any of those. When Lasky first approached York about the film, Lasky was head owner of Famous Players, later becoming Paramount Studios. When York finally approved the film, Lasky had lost the film company and was only an independent film producer. He had to put up his own money to start the project. Alvin York approved the film in February 1940. RKO was supposed to do the film in color, but backed out. MGM wanted to do it, but for more money and control than what Lasky was willing to give up. Ultimately, thanks to the ultra-patriot Harry Warner, Warner Brothers picked up the project, but would only do it as a black-and-white film. Ronald Reagan was considered for the role of Sergeant York. 
but Alvin York insisted only Gary Cooper to play his life on screen. Cooper at first turned down the role. When York himself contacted the star with a personal plea, Cooper agreed to do the picture. Gary Cooper first earned his living as a cowboy stunt writer. He starred in one of the earliest talkie, Virginian, 1929. He became a lead actor in A Farewell to Arms, 1932, The Lives of the Bengal Lancers, 1935, and The Plainsman, 1937. In Frank Capra's Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, 1936, and Meet John Doe, 1941, Cooper is on screen as a man fighting for what is right. Cooper's on-screen persona as Mr. Deeds and action war heroes may have impressed Alvin York. The screenplay was assigned to Harry Chandley and Abern Finkel, based upon Sergeant York, his own life story and war diary, written by Alvin York, edited by Tom Scahill. Director Howard Hawks was officially brought on the project December 16th two months before filming was to start. Hawks accepted the position as a personal favor to Lasky, who gave Hawks a job back in 1923 as production editor for Famous Players. As a late arrival to the project, very few outside the cast and a crew appreciated Hawks' contribution toward the film. Hawks was known for films in a variety of genre. His most recent successes included Only Angels Have Wings, Bringing Up Baby, and His Girl Friday. After Hawks read the original Sergeant York script, he had writers John Houston, then 34-year-old rising writer, and Howard Koch, who wrote the radio broadcasts of Orson Welles' The War of the Worlds rework the script during the Christmas to New Year's holiday, an open secret in Hollywood. Another issue was the casting of Alvin York's wife. Alvin made it clear he didn't want no cigarette-smoking and drinking actress with any sort of notoriety betraying his wife. Jane Russell was being considered for the part of Gracie. Just weeks before shooting started, Joan Leslie was selected for the part. She was 16, the age as the real Gracie in the film. Though her screen time was limited, Joan projected Gracie as a backwoods woman, yet strong, intelligent, and knew what she wanted and importantly, what Hawks wanted, a Hawksian woman. She was so young because she was so good. She acted so young and effervescent and like a girl in love. But I thought Gary Cooper was so old. I mean, he was 40 when he made the movie. And sometimes when he had a close-up, I felt he looked his age. He, he looked too old for her. but. As a whole, I think, of course, you know, he's a good actor, but I think he um, was too old for the part to play against Gracie. And that was one reason Gary Cooper didn't want to play the part, because he thought he was too old. But Alvin York personally told Cooper he was right for the role. Ox rapport with his cast and crew was excellent which always annoyed the production chief. Mr. Hawks has been in the habit of providing tea and cake for his staff every day. Dickie Moore, as Alvin's younger brother, said, at one point in a scene, I smiled accidentally. Hawks said, very good, we'll try another one. But he took me aside and said, everything you're doing is good but at no time in this entire picture does George have to smile. Don't think you have to. Only when you feel like it. So I totally relaxed. 
How he sensed that, I'll never know. Note, behind Dickie Moore happened to be the only females with spoken lines in the film. Stage actress Margaret Witcherly, playing Alvin's mom, and young June Lockhart as Alvin's sister, as well as Joan Leslie. I thought the cast was absolutely amazing. I thought his mother was so strong. She didn't even have to say anything. He was so fearful of her and so respectful of her. And I think he loved his mother more deeply than his future wife because, of course, he had a longer relationship with his mother than he did with the girlfriend. The woman who played his mother was a scary looking. She had like these sunken eyes. She looked very witchy. Her name almost sounds witchy actually. Um, and she was just ugly. She was ugly to look at. She was, I mean, her, her role in the movie was not ugly, but I had a lot of difficulty looking at her because she looked, she looked so dark and weathered and, uh, I don't know what else she played in. But... That was her first film. She oh, was what? a stage. There was she's a stage actor, a very well known and very successful stage actor. And it's like you read the backstories and some of that, and go, "Wow!" So the uh, the mother looked like somebody I'd see walking down the street. <laughs> they didn't have time or money for makeup or hair. You know, they just had to do, you know, they brought in their eggs to get a little salt, you know, whatever. Hawks really liked her visually as the mom, but he kept cutting back what she said down to just a few words. She often would reply, but that was my best lines. Um, I loved mom. I loved everything about mom. I thought her face and her countenance and her character, she, it communicated the the I don't they were poor but they had food and shelter so they were impoverished but showed the strain there was no husband she brought up this family they lived in the higher ground um so the the, the it was harder just to make a living for her son and I thought her manner and that showed just love and dedication to her children and it just communicated the struggle that people uh, in in hillbillies or whatever you want to call them um, have in, in life. Populating the cast were overwhelmingly male actors, including familiar faces as George Tobias, Noel Berry Jr., and Ward Bond. As far as uh, when I saw Noah Berry and uh, Ward Bond at the very beginning, I immediately recognized them, and I was a wagon train freak. I mean, I, I watched Westerns all the time on TV, and then I realized everybody knows these people, but to see them young in their career, I also enjoyed. And the most familiar face was Walter Brennan as country pastor Rosier Pyle. From 1925 to 1972, he played in 230 films and TV roles, eight films with Gary Cooper. Um, oh, Walter Brennan, man, he was so good. He deserved an Academy Award. I don't know who, who was running that year, but whether he was yelling or preaching or talking kindly and lovingly to him, or helping the family. He did it all so perfectly. He, he was really good. Brennan had won three Academy Awards for Best Supporting Actor. He was popular with the Extras Union, who had cast votes in the Academy Awards. After Brennan won his third Oscar in just five years, the Academy barred the Extras Union from the voting process. This possibly deprived him a fourth Oscar for his role in Sergeant York. The film follows Alvin York, born into a poor family in rural Tennessee, whose claim to fame is Daniel Boone lived nearby. The film 
tried to show real people, not ignorant country bumpkins. Just regular folks trying to get along with what little they had. The local folks may not care what is going on in Europe, but when called to arms, most men patriotically enlisted. An incorrigible troublemaker, he drank heavily and fought often. I often wondered in movies, in bar scenes, where two people have an altercation and they decide to resolve it with fists. And then all of a sudden, all the people in the bar are punching each other out. <laughs> How does it get from two people to all these people are having individual altercations and then bottles are flying and tables are being flipped over? Alcohol. I've never, I've never Alcohol. Been, Alcohol. Alcohol. <laughs> Is that it? I mean, it's like to setting off a powder keg, you know, that they're all sitting there waiting for a reason to punch each other out. And, you know, when one starts, it's like dominoes. Okay, you know, now I, I've, I've always had such a hard, hard time with those bar scenes for that reasons. Why it, but I guess if alcohol is the fuel for the rage, it makes sense. In the film, Alvin York becomes religious after surviving a thunderstorm. Hollywood added the dramatic lightning bolt and church revival to perk up the film's pace. Can take us all to heaven. In fact, it was his future wife, Gracie Williams, who helped Alvin York undergo his religious awakening to the Bible. Later in the film, York remarked, War is killing, and the book's again killing. So war is, is again the book. I was fascinated by the dialogue um, because it... It was really like a foreign language to me. I had to really concentrate on the dialogue, but I, I thought it was perfect for the movie. I was also fascinated by all of York's um, relationships. The courtship, it reminded me of um, my grandfather always said that he saw my grandmother across the street and told his best friend, I'm going to marry that girl one day. And they were married for over 70 years. And I, I think courtships back then were, were so much different and um, maybe better. I don't know. Um, it, it just, I, I just love the relationships. That's what really struck me about this movie. So um, I had never seen it before. I enjoyed watching it. Thank you. His um, fellow army comrades um they were teasing him yet he didn't take that on and he he stayed above that and i i like that i i like that at the end he said i, I want to go on a subway ride um that was that was wonderful as i was watching the movie i was thinking about the fact that it was made during the time that we were uh, uh, exposed to a war that we were reluctant to get into and the risk that a director like Howard Hawks takes when he makes a movie and does it shape pub public opinion or do people just watch it you know, as entertainment um, I don't know many other movies that are, you know, made in the middle of a crisis where they actually have an outcome, an effect on the outcome of the crisis. So um, this movie, for that reason, you know, stands out in my mind. When the film was being made, American public opinion was strongly isolationist and Warner Brothers worried that it would be condemned for being too pro-war. The studio went to great lengths
to avoid marketing the film as a war picture. I have mixed feelings about the the movie. I love the um, he showed respect, love of family and his country. He was conflicted because of his religious beliefs, yet um, he supported his country. York returned from the war still against killing. He killed German soldiers to save his fellow comrades. Yet the killing continued to haunt his memories. When he was on a film set, one of the crew members asked him how many Jerry's he had killed. York started sobbing so much he threw up. The crew member was nearly fired, but York demanded he keep his job. It more easily makes us who have never been in such a situation the understanding of what predominantly these men go through and maybe can make us more sensitized when they come home to be a little more supportive of their needs because I think what men experience in war is outside the bounds of what anybody should have to endure. And Filming was done in the Warner Burbank Studios, the Back Lots, and San Bernardino in February to May 1941. Though the U.S. was not at war, no filming was done in France. Germany occupied four-fifths of the French territory, while the other one-fifth by German collaborator Vichy. Because of the limited number of sound stages available, the art department was forced to wait for the company to finish one set before demolishing it and quickly building the next. 123 sets were required for this picture, including an enormous farmland and mountain set on a revolving merry-go-round base to allow different perspectives. With a 200-foot stream and 121 trees, here's the setup for Gary Cooper's mountain scene. Obviously, you know, the violence in it is not a genre I'm comfortable with. Uh, you can't make a war movie without having some violence, but the violence in this seemed endless, really endless. The total action of fighting in France amounted to less than 20 minutes of the entire 255 minute movie. Howard Hawks skillfully showed the consequences of injuries, deaths, and bomb explosions flying around the battlefield. I actually don't like the violence or the, you know, the war scenes, but it was, um, it almost reminded me of the little army action figures, you know, running over the hills and seeing the people. So it was very, like Wendy said, sanitized, very, um, you know, not really some of the agony that, you know, went on during World War One because that was very violent and very hard, um, I would think, to witness, you know, what happened uh, in the trenches there. There's a movie out recently, also a true story of a conscientious objector, Hacksaw Ridge, and the guy ended up being a medic, uh, a true story, a medic, and heroically saved so many people. But the violence in that movie and what you saw with your eyes, the gore, um, was so much more realistic. I thought probably because of when it was filmed, the war scenes in York, Sergeant York were very sanitized as all movies were back then. But nowadays you get much more blood and gore, which is an, an agony, pain, and it's so hor horrific to watch. Howard Hawks also knew when to relieve tension. You mean to say that you and seven others captured all that bunch? Yes, sir. And we'd kind of like to get rid of them. Well, good Lord. I guess we can give you some help. One minor flaw in filming was Gary Cooper used as his sidearm a German Luger. It was the only reliable pistol available that could shoot blanks. Iconic moment in the film. Load. 
Aim. Fire. A bullseye, four o'clock. Bullseye. I can't figure out how I got way down there on the edge. Hawks conceded that the wetting of the rifle sight to cut down the glare was a fabrication, as well as the film's turkey shoot scenario to serve as a plot device for the later combat Why did it go scene. Why goes to Ruse, Just a few days before shooting ended, Howard Hawks announced that he was leaving on May 1st to attend the Kentucky Derby. A contract director, Vincent Sherman, followed Hawks' instruction for the final scenes in which York is decorated. Feature the people who are doing the decorating. We've seen enough of Coop. Sherman remarked, Seeing the picture later, he was right. He had an uncanny sense of story of what was important in the scene. Sergeant York wrapped May 3rd after 70 days of actual shooting, 22 days longer than what was originally scheduled. The film's editor, Williams Holmes, had less than two months to finalize Sergeant York before its premiere in New York City on July 1st. He finished with a couple of weeks to spare. Holmes received the Academy Award for editing the film. By the film's release, Adolf Hitler had conquered much of Europe and the public attitude towards U.S. involvement of the war shifted. When the film premiered on July 1st in New York City, jingoism was in the air. Opening night included Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, Wendell Wilkie, General Pershing, and Mayor LaGuardia. When the film premiered on July 1st in New York City, jingoism was in the air. Opening night included Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, Window Wilkie, General Pershing, and Mayor LaGuardia. President Franklin D. Roosevelt was so thrilled with Sergeant York that he invited Alvin York to the White House. York spoke of the need for war readiness. It's a very interesting political movie at the time, too, because the United States was very much in the neutrality mode. Uh, they were isolationists completely. And in fact, uh, Congress, I believe, they stopped the showing of this film for a period of time because it was, they said it was violating the Neutrality Act. Congress was pressured by America's first committee that believed U.S. shouldn't be involved in any European war. The group, at its height in 1940 to 41, had 450 chapters with 800,000 members. Its most outspoken leader was aviator Charles Lindbergh. Many of its members were pro-fascist and anti-Semitic. Absent from the premiere was Howard Hawks, who preferred to stay in Hollywood preparing for his next film, which also starred Gary Cooper and Barbara Stanwyck in a comedy Ball of Fire, that began filming on August 1st. Writer Billy Wilder couldn't resist adding this scene to Ball of Fire. Hey, a picture last week. Sergeant York film was shown to officers and crew on the deck of the USS Enterprise the evening of December 6, 1941 when the carrier was anchored off Hawaii. The next day, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. 
As the United States suddenly enters World War II, the battle scenes in Sergeant York takes on more significant hey, meaning to the film's audience. One's got your name on it. There's nothing you can do. The film's patriotic theme helped recruit soldiers. Young men sometimes went directly from the movie theater to military enlistment offices. The film was frequently re-shown at theaters all over America during the war for bond sales and scrap drives. The America's first committee dissolved four days after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. During the war, Lindbergh was rejected to serve in the armed forces, but as a civilian, took part in over 50 combat bomber raids over the Pacific. Sergeant York was nominated for 11 Academy Awards in 1941. However, How Green Was My Valley won the Best Picture Award, directed by John Ford, Howard Hawks' rival. On in history as being one of the classic Everybody selects for one of the greatest films ever made. But because of Hearst and the, they didn't like uh, Arson Wells, and so RKO had a big uh, hill to climb, and they really didn't get very much at all. And uh, if you haven't ever watched How Green Was My Valley, it's a, it's a cute, it's a nice movie, but it's not Citizen Kane. Mm -hmm. uh, also, also the, you were asking about the guy that was in... Uh, how Green is My Valley did get the... Uh... Gary Cooper did win his first Best Actor Award for the Sergeant York role. Shucks, I've been in this business 16 years and sometimes dreamt I might get one of these things. That's all I can say. Funny, when I was dreaming, I always made a good speech. As he left the stage, he forgot the Oscar on the podium. Gary Cooper said, Sergeant York won me an Academy Award, but that's not why it's my favorite film. I like the role because I portrayed a good, sound American character. Two weeks before the Academy Awards ceremony, Cooper began filming Pride of the Yankees. He was first reluctant to play the Yankee All-Star who had died the previous year from ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Cooper knew very little about baseball and was not left-handed like Garrett. Similarly, as in Sergeant York, he accepted the title role as a personal request, this time from Garrett's widow. Yet another film with Walter Brennan. Uh, Gary Cooper was, uh, you know, he went on and got a second Academy Award in High Noon. And uh, it's like, it, he's just one of those people that any movie he's in, it, it's great. I, I liked it. I liked, liked him in this one. And uh, <clears throat> Sergeant York returned six million in domestic rentals, making it the third biggest box office attraction in film history. After Gone with the Wind, which then stood at 18 million, and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which had earned 7.15 million. The following program is from Affectionados who watched the film and discussed that film at the group's weekly Zoom meeting. The commentary voice are opinions of each individual blogger and have been edited for clarity. Zoom Zoom, the movie break review. Thanks for watching.